Uh, but here, you know, you, you don't get everything you want in life, I realized. Uh, but what I want is trauma-free uh, incident management, and that is a topic I care a lot about and um, been working with uh, for a few years now. So I want to tell you about that, and I think it can. Uh, some of you might find it relevant. Anyway, so I think of kind of incident management as kind of the process that happen b in addition to normal processes. So you have a normal process. You are building your software. You're writing tests. You're deploying in orderly fashion, picking off tickets, and suddenly something happens. Something bad happens that needs immediate attention. And everything goes out the window, and you have to sort of focus this thing up and work with it. And that is kind of the try catch here, where you sort of know, let's do the incident management. And I think everybody has an incident management process. I think most people has a bad incident management process that ends up leaving, making you make the incident feel kind of life shortening destructive. I've been in some incidents before I got into this process thing that really felt bad for me. It felt a little bit like if I, if you know this, I don't know the English word for this, but gems in Swedish, uh, you cannot pull them apart by hand. But if you bend them back and forth a couple of times, you do a plastic deformation and the strength of these diminishes and in the end, the break. And I felt that way when I was having some incidents that, boy, if I do this too many times, like these things, I'm going to break. And I don't want that. And you could feel like this enormous weight on your shoulder, I felt in some incidents, where you like, it, it's important for the company, for the customer. And I just feel it stacking on, to the, on top of me. And sometimes I felt I'm the, alone in this world, against everything, and it's up to me, and it's my fault if I don't get it right. And I could fe feel this stress building up inside me, uh, which is not good for your health, but also causes a brain freeze sometimes. So sometimes when I watched, I used to watch a television show about air crashes, and some people then, they got stuck. They, they should take action to preserve their life, but they just freeze. And I was thinking, why are they doing that? But I've been in the same situation with incidents where I'm, it's too much for me. I, I just get stuck. And it's, it's, ex it's a very strange feeling. It's a very bad feeling. And in the end, you talk to someone and maybe you get unstuck. But it's not good for you. And it's not the best way to solve an incident. And sometimes you have the feeling like, here we go again with this thing. Why are we never improving? Why are we always ending up in this situation? And I learned... It doesn't have to be this way. I kind of thought it had to be this way. Incidents are special cases. We should avoid them. Uh, but I learned from working with an incident management process that incidents can be instead a way to learn. That an incident, I think, is uh, it puts this kind of um, light through your architecture. You have this beautiful architecture, like a, model, like a car. It's smooth. It's nice. Everything works. Nothing is wrong with it. But then incident happens, and you see these connections between the systems. You see these hacks that you were supposed to refactor but never did refactor. And all of these things are now apparent to you, and you're thinking, boy, we should fix this. And this means this is a good... You, the incident now gives you a good op learning opportunity. And from these learning opportunities, you can extract improvements if you have a process that supports it. And I feel also that it can build trust. So most customers that you're working with that are smart and sensible people, there are customers that are not, they understand that when you're running in production in real life, things happen. And, and what they want to see, I think, what the smart people want to see is like, okay, things are happening, but at least the team working with this, the team working for me, work rationally with the problem. They're communicating effectively. They're working as quickly and as safely as possible to make sure this incident disappears. And they're learning from it. So that in the future, there's less risk of this happening again. And that way, I felt when doing this properly, the relationship with the customer has improved. Uh, instead of the, Everybody agrees the incident was bad, but it actually almost got better. So a bit of background about me. So my name is Morten Ronge, and uh, I've been working with incidents, I've been working for many years, and I sort of have been exposed to at times. And uh, it was really when I started at Sheepstead, my last place of work, that I was in, in sort of introduced to a more rational way of working with it. So at Sheepstead, I got uh, put into a product called Pulse. Uh, so you might know Sheepstead, some of you don't, but uh, really you probably do if you live in Sw Sweden and Norway, because Sheepstead owns Aftonbladet, uh, they own SVD, they own Blocket, they own Prisiak, they own Aftonposten, they own, you know, the list goes on, like 30 newspapers in Norway, and Finn is a huge thing in Norway, bigger than Blocket, kind of. 
So they have a lot of assets, and all of these assets, the sheep that are interested in knowing what's going on, what are people looking at, how can we improve the site? And they, of course, use Google Analytics, but they also use something called Pulse. And Pulse is the product that sort of funnel all these events to, that we rec and we're receiving that. And I was working with this product. And we, we re relieved, received roughly five terabytes per day uh, when I left. And that is approximately 2.5 billion events, JSON events per day, which is compared to Facebook, nothing. But compared to many other companies, I would say it's pretty much. And we wrote 15 terabytes per day uh, of data because our job was you get a JSON document that contains some data. data. We look at it and we say, oh, this is going to Aftonbladet, and this is going to this location-based service, and this is going here, and so on and so forth. It's a very simple <laughs> product, kind of except five terabytes of data, you know, and it can't go down. So that is the challenge, kind of. And what happened to me, I started that, and there were many sort of developers there, so, but after one year, um, for some reason, all the senior people that has built the service, pull service, they were gone. And I was kind of the oldest person in the team, and therefore, I need to know, I obviously know what I'm doing, but this was a new thing to me, right? So I kind of, yeah, I kind of remember these people, what they talked about, but I was kind of now, people were looking to me a little bit, I felt, when things are happening. And my biggest fears was that I get on the Christmas card list of these people. Uh, because when you have incidents regarding security, Ralph Bennett, who's on the ground left there, very nice guy, but he has a scary title, Chief Information Security Officer. When, when he starts to call you by first name basis, you've been in too many incidents with that guy. But even more scary is the woman on the right, Ingvild Vilnes. She's the chief privacy data officer. She is the GDPR responsible person. So when you are like first name basis with her, you've been in some privacy incidents together. And we got to know each other pretty well. <laughs> and the reason for that was because Pools was kind of this um, product that was sort of, you know, at the center of the information flowing into Sheepstead, we, it was, okay, we screwed up sometimes, and then even we did security problems, and then we talked to uh, Ralph Bennett. But sometimes Aftonblad had sent us data, they shouldn't have sent us. They, everybody know they did it. Okay, how do we work with that now? So, and then that created an incident. And because I was the old guy in the team, I very often become uh, sort of, you know, running these incidents projects. And this was called at Cheapset the INS, uh, IMAS, which is Incident Management at Cheapset. And I think this was taken from Google or Facebook or merged together. There were very smart people in the management, around, I think, around the IT in Cheapset. And they devised this thing. And I want to, this presentation is about telling you about my experience with this thing. I used to tell them, I think this is the best thing Cheapset have done. Forget block it. This is the good stuff we're doing. But, it really changed how I work with incidents and how I think about it. And I don't think I'm a very good at dealing with stress. But with this process kind of behind me, I have been in some very serious incidents and come out not destroyed. So there are some concepts here. We are using abbreviations. Of course, this is computer in industry, so we have to use three letter acronyms. But this is the kind of things everybody has to learn, kind of. So the, the centerpiece of the process is the live incident document. That's the lid. That is a document that is live. And we put it in Google Docs, which is a good place for live incident document because everybody can edit it. And the point of this in document is, you know, when you have an instance and you have a Slack channel started and start working and then your boss shows up and he says, I want to know what's going on. And you have to do, explain what's going on. And the boss's boss shows up and you have to explain it again. And the boss's boss on the, in another department shows up and says, we are also affected, please explain. And you're explaining the same thing over and over again. One way to get around the problem is that you maintain a live incident document describing the state of the incident, how, what you're currently doing. And when they come into a Slack channel demanding to know what to do, and they shouldn't ask because they should know the process. But if they ask, you say, go to a lid and read it up. And when they re read the lid, they can come back and say, I have inputs on how to improve it, the situation, or they just shut up. And so I think that's a very important thing. But the important thing is done to make sure the lead is up to date, because if the lead is not up to date, they can't go back, it, uh, it, this is, you know, it's not right. And the person that kind of is the center person in this uh, uh, process is the IC, incident commander, that is kind of the boss, 
or as I see it, kind of the um, project manager in a crazy project with sort of, you know, where everything is burning down around you. And that is the person that sort of um, runs the entire show. And kind of the most important thing that this person does is maintaining the lid to make sure that is the thing. The, because if it's not okay, then people are going to bother the team. But the also, also person also makes sure that the team works toward mitigating the incidents. Not finding the perfect fix, we're not looking for that. We are looking to make sure that the incident is resolved so we can go back to normal business processes. So yes, we might still have problems, but we take them like tickets. High priority tickets, but normal tickets. So we want to stop the bleeding of the patient, shove them in an ambulance and to the hospital, and there they get proper treatment. So no fancy solutions, you just get it mitigated. And making sure the team is focused on this, because people might easily get defocused. And the thing here, what can easily happen is the person that starts the process is not the right person to do it. But the person that sees an incident becomes the instant commander. So, for example, when I was out the summer and um, I saw a cable fell down on the street, I was, had my corona shot. And I bicycle home and I saw a big cable on the street. I stopped, Whoa, what's this? Um, uh, what should I do? I don't know what to do, but I call the fire department. And they say, sure, we send, uh, we send a truck. But I was kind of the instant commander in that role. I had no skills, but I could pick up the phone and call someone that sort of dispatched people. And the, the truck arrived, and some guy jumped out, and he took over, and now he's the instant commander. But we have an instant commander. And this is also important that we have to make sure that the process always includes an instant commander. You don't want to have, end up in a situation where an instant has no commander. So in order to do that, we, it's very important to have a handoff process. So. Um, so if, uh, I, if I'm at work and work with an incident, and then uh, Osman, my coworker, shows up and says, um, I think I'm the better person to do, be the incident commander here. Should I do it? Of course, I don't want to be the incident commander. It's a lot of work. So what I said, sure, Osman, take it over. But we are not just saying take it over. Instead, Osman, I said, say to Osman, Osman, go to a lid and put in your name as an incident commander. And Osman does that. And then I check it. And I see he put in his name. Now it should be pretty clear to us that Osman is the new instant commander. We don't want to end up in a situation where I think Osman is the instant commander and Osman think I'm the instant commander and we both go to bed. So, so that is the handoff process is very important. Now, the second role here is the operation lead. So if the incident is small, the incident commander is the operation lead. But what can easily happen if things you know, start escalating? You cannot keep up with the tasks. So then you delegate, for example, again, Osmond. I say to Osmond, Osmond, I can't deal with all this. P please, please, operation lead to me. Sure enough, Osmond goes into lead, puts his name in operation lead, comes back to me, it's done. I check it, now it's operation lead. And the operation lead's task here is to make sure we are working on reading logs, we are sort of uh, doing investigations and trying to mitigate. I, as an incident commander, I must focus on the lead, communicating with stakeholders, or these kind of things that can take time. The product manager. And then communication lead, um, which thankfully I never had to use. But the kind of idea with the communication lead, if you're a really bad spot in a, on your company like Sheepstead, you might need to write a press release uh, explaining to people how you screwed up. You don't want me to write a press release. I cannot really do that job properly. So then you have to bring in extra competence, and that is the uh, communication lead. Thankfully, I never got that bad. And in the end, what we do is the incident review, which is extremely important, because we need to learn from what we're doing. This is an opportunity to learn and improve our processes. So incident review is also very important for us. Um, Another thing here is that everyone should know the process. Like, like in Norway and Sweden, if I see a fire, I call the number 112, 113. In Norway, it's complicated because they have three numbers. I never really know which one to call. But in Sweden, it's, it's simpler. It's 112. Uh, because I'm old, I want to call 90,000. But uh, it's 112. That's what everyone needs to know. They need to know how to kick it off. Someone might see it at a web page. The web page is down raise the instant level, and that person is the instant, instant commander now, and you know, whatever they can do is good. And for me, we use pay to duty for that, but that's not important. It's important that everybody knows how to the process a little bit and how to kick it off. As an example here, I want to give you a little bit of, I'm going to check the time. 
I want to give you a little bit uh, example of a real insert of having a cheap set. I have a lot of incidents I could tell, I can't tell you about, but this one I can tell you about because it's kind of innocent, although, although serious. Uh, the best ones I, I, I can't tell you while being sober. So uh, um, this incident started like many good incidents with the phrase, what's the worst that can happen? Um, and what I was supposed to do at that time was we were running Amazon Web Services and I was just supposed to do a simple tag change on our services for observability reasons. In order to track cost better, they have to have tags. And I'm supposed to do just change the tags. Done it a million times, never been a problem, even though I need to change the tag for the front service, which we call collector, which is the thing in front. And if that goes down, it's bad. But we've done this before. We have automated processes. It should not be a problem. I talked to my main guy there called Carlos, and he agreed, what's the worst that can happen? This is just going to go so easily. We'll be done by lunch. So it was really, from our point of view, as safe as Shaneus goes. And obviously, you realize it didn't go that well. So immediately after deploying, the cluster went up. It went green in our uh, dashboard. The old cluster said, oh, it's green. Now I can die. And the traffic just disappeared. And the point of our service is to collect traffic and data. And if you don't collect data, it's not much point to what we're doing. So this is kind of bad. So, and then what we learned from bitter experience is, okay, immediately revert. Okay, launch the old, old cluster and just fix the problem in, in the in PR and try again. But that didn't work here. This cluster worked fine five minutes ago, but when we launched a new cluster with the exact same version, it didn't work. That's not what you want to see. So then I'm like, oh boy, this is not good. So it was like a severity two incidents, severity one. I mean, we lost data. Okay, that's bad. But if, we, if this was a privacy one where we leaked data, that's one. That's extreme bad. So this is like, it's bad, but not life-threatening bad. Um, so it's bad. And since I kind of kicked off the incident, and I'm, I said, okay, I'm going to be the incident commander of this incident. I'm going to do that. But this is going to be hairy because I'm already getting messages over Slack. And this is like 30 seconds in. I'm getting messages on Slack that the traffic is down for them. Do, am I aware? Yes, I'm aware on Slack, right? You know. So I said, Carlos, I need help here. And uh, yeah, he said, I can't believe it, but let's go. We kind of been in this boat together before. So. So to talk to Carlos very briefly. Okay, Carlos, what we're going to do here? Get the traffic up and running. I don't care how you do it, Carlos. Just make it run. This is kind of like the patient is dead on the floor, heart stop beating. Get it beat again somehow. I don't know how to do it, but just make it happen, Carlos. And meanwhile, I did instant commander stuff, which was creating the lead, creating Slack, and notifying War Room. So Sheeps has automation for that. That's really good. So I basically filled in a little bit of information, and they kicked off the lead. Uh, and in lead, we used the Google Docs, which I mentioned already, but it's really good for this. We use a Slack channel to have the discussion, and it also announced in the war room, which is also good for my personal health, because now people see, yes, there's an incident that pulls, I don't have to bother Morton about it. He's on it. And that also happens when we are, um, uh, did the uh, kicked off the incident. So I maintained the lead. I wrote up what I knew, which wasn't much, but we're working on it. And we are trying to fix a get the mitigation to work as soon as possible. Luckily for us, uh, or Carlos and others were very, uh, you know, resourceful, and they found a mitigation like three minutes in or something, four minutes into this incident. And what they noticed was that they logged on to the virtual machine, and they noticed the web server is not running, which was surprising, and the logs were weird. So let's try to start web server and see what it says uh, when it boots. Maybe we can understand. And it started. Just fine. Nothing, pro no problems. It just started. But it didn't start when it was supposed to. But now it started. Okay, but then we could see traffic started coming in. Okay, but then we just log in to each machine and start the web server automatically. And we found kind of like we, s we got the heart beating barely, but at least it's, you know, blood is going around the body. But we know this is not a good solution because the symptoms have now spread to other services. We don't understand this, but we, when we looked at other services, we saw that all new machines were getting red in the, in the, in the in cluster, meaning they don't work. And the same thing, the web server don't start. And we don't get it, really. So while traffic was flowing, and from the outside, it looked like we were good, we knew we can't have it like this because we had auto-scaling. Because when you have the pulse traffic, 
around six o'clock at night or ten o'clock at night, it's really big. People are surfing a lot, and then at three o'clock in the morning, there's almost no traffic. So our our services are going up and down, sort of, you know, to handle that. <laughs> but that means then when we are adding new machines, we need one guy sitting there running the web server. That doesn't seem very scalable to us. So we need something better than this. Uh, we need to find a way to sort of stabilize the service. Um, so, um, uh, well, we did something completely random, it seemed. Uh, so we were running an OpenJDK, and we had switched from Oracle a few weeks ago, and it has been working fine. So we thought, well, we can always try to run on Oracle again, because it seemed to be JVM-related. The JVM crashed for us. So then we switched to Oracle, and everything worked. And we're like, OK, that's great, because now suddenly we no longer have to stay up at night and start web services. Now we can sort of, you know, uh, relax a little bit. We have a working solution. We want to get away from Oracle JDK, but it's not as bad as it was. And then I could declare the incident mitigated. It's not fixed, but now we can move to normal team processes from doing that. And that was goal one. This was maybe two hours in to the incident. It, um, so immediately called an incident review, because we have to get going with this, solving this issue. And during the incident review, we try to establish a common understanding, go through the timeline, making sure everyone understood what happened. We didn't really understand much because this was confusing to us. And we, we identified some actions that we want to get, take, basically call us, figure this one out. We have to, you know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and then we, in an incident review, which you often don't talk about, but we also try to praise people's effort, you know, people that don't better than expected, right? Or like really good response time from the team. We were up and running in like three minutes. That was good. You know, we try to sort of lift up some positive things. And then uh, Carlos spent some time investigating. But this is done in normal team process. So you remember the try-catch thing I had in the beginning. Now we're out of the exception handler. We're back into normal team process. So we can do this with tickets. We don't have to work overtime. We want to fix this. But it's no longer, you know, critical. And just to tell you what it was a little bit, which was a huge surprise to us, but as I guess I say, an incident is an opportunity to learn. Uh, we thought we had inf immutable infrastructure, uh, but it turns out we didn't. So what we did was that we took, when we deployed, when we created a new um, base image, we took a snapshot of that virtual machine image. That became a base image. And then when we started new machines, we used that snapshot. Thus, all the instances are identical, right? Well, no, uh, but it should be. But it turned out that Amazon has a special service running when the machine starts, and it detected that our open JDK was missing some critical security updates. So being very nice people, Amazon, right? They installed a new version of open JDK and deleted the old one. And what happened was that, that our web service started with the old JDK. And then halfway through everything, the JDK was gone. And then it crashed with extremely mysterious faults. And that also explained why even when we logged into the machine and started the manual, it worked because now it had, um, uh, so because now it had uh, a working JDK. So that was for us a surprise, but very useful learnings. Uh, let's see what I had, if I've written a few things. So, we extracted, I think, three key learnings from this incident, from this thing here. One, we learned that we were not immutable at all, we thought we were. And the way to handle this is we have to make sure that our web service starts after the update is done, so we don't crash in the middle. Then, if, if our stupid bash script that was starting a web server had a little loop, just starting the web server each time, it, if it just crashed, just start it again, it seems reasonable, then this would never be a problem. We probably even never noticed it. it. It just took a little bit long to start. And then the third case uh, was our health checks in our most important service said it was green when it instead didn't work at all. And that's why the cl new cluster went up. It was green and the old cluster was destroyed. And so that was not good because if that health check had worked, the new cluster would never gone online and we would never got into the critical things. So three things we learned here, three improvements that we didn't, we actually thought half of them were done, uh, but we learned, no, they're not done. So that was a very important improvement to this very important service. And at that point, we considered the incident closed. So I just want to give you a little bit sort of um, 
a feeling for how we sort of um, use this um, um, process to sort of fight an incident which was very critical to our team. And this was called uh, incident management at Cheapset, but I'm no longer at Cheapset, I'm at a place called Contracting Works. And I felt we needed an iMac, which is incident management at contracting. Uh, and it has been very useful for us, and we have the exact same ideas. We have the lead, we have the incident commander, or operation lead, the communication lead, and the uh, incident review. The idea is, although I feel I have not really succeeded here, but the idea is that everybody should know the process. But I'm working towards that. Uh, we don't have much automation, although I want to do it. But I have compensated with automation with checklists. A checklist is better than nothing. So even though I would like just to click a button and everything is created, uh, instead I have a checklist that people go through. Another very important thing, and this was also in IMAS, is to try to create a blame-free environment. We are not trying to pin, you know, I screwed up here, but it won't. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't help if Carla says it was Morton's fault, you know, because if you have that environment where you're trying to pin blame on people, people will not tell the truth about what they are doing. They will try to sort of shift blame. And that is not the best way to extract learnings and improve the system. Uh, we wanted to create an environment where it was safe to say, um, I did this, uh, I did these steps. I thought they were good, but obviously they were not, so we can improve the process. It also should be safe to say, and this often happen happens in incidents, that I get totally stuck on something. This is the problem, and I'm looking at things, I don't, I don't, but it doesn't make sense, but I'm still I'm completely stuck. And some guy says, wait a second, it's not this service that is the problem, it's the one before it is breaking. And you want an environment where this, everybody can speak up and say, I'm thinking you're looking in the wrong place, even I'm older than most of them. And an example from this is the air crash in industry, where air crashes have been hap happening because the captain, they had a minor problem with the airplane, and the captain was looking for a landing strip to land on, and was very focused on that task. And the co-pilot noticed there's a much bigger problem coming, and we're running out of fuel in 20 minutes. Which is, then you, and this is also a thing you don't want to avoid in incident, where you go from a severity three to severity one, you, you don't want that, that's bad. So, so the co-pilot tried to tell the captain, but the captain was too focused. And it, this was a culture where p the co-pilot had a lot of respect for the captain. So he didn't dare to disturb the captain with the minor detail that the airplane was running out of fuel. And in the end, ran out of fuel, and it went down. So you want an environment where it's f the, the co-pilot, so to say, feels safe to say, you're looking, this is not important. The fuel gauge, that's what's important. Snap out of it and go, OK, you're right. So I think this helps me at least a lot in that it gives, I think this incident process gives a clear responsibility on what we're supposed to do. I'm the incident commander, I'm doing certain things. The operation leads do certain things. Uh, it gives a certain structure in the chaotic mess that is an incident. So before I kind of winged it, how to work an incident, you know, and it didn't feel good. I also think that it's very easy when people sit down, we, we, can, we must fix this incident process, right? You make a, uh, you make a process that is like uh, 20 web pages long, and nobody understands it. You need something that gives you this little structure, this little focus, that is not too hard to understand. Uh, and it, we, it has a built-in way to extract learnings. Once again, an incident gives you an excellent way to learn something about your system you thought you did or you didn't know. It handles handoffs, which is very important. We don't want to end up with an incident without an incident commander, because then nothing will happen. And I think it reduces stress. And this is from a person, myself, I don't think I'm a very good, I don't think I'm very good at handling stress. But I've been in some really nasty incidents at Cheapstats, and it never felt too much. Uh, and it also gives focus for the team to fo work the problem. Uh, so before the questions, um, I want to show you a little bit how, um, how it work, looks in our uh, uh, instant management thing here. So now uh, we use, I use uh, OneNote as a live instant document. Uh, Google Docs might be better, but we, we choose OneNote here because it's also kind of a live document. Uh, here I have kind of an area where we have I have described the process at, at the whole, but usually what I try to do, I try to mentor it and try to give people, this is how you do it, by 
participating or by role playing. You can also role play incidents in order to teach people how to do it. Uh, I mentioned I would like automations, but instead I've written checklists. So this is how you start an incident in our way. Uh, you create a lead and you create a Teams channel. This, so automation would be better. Checklist is better than nothing. And then I have an area here with, uh, with all the incidents that have happened. And we had a few since uh, uh, April last uh, year. Not all of them serious, but sometimes we just think this is a good process to use. Um, so this is the template. And you can, but it's important that you have this repository of incidents because if when you run into an issue again, you might think, I wonder if someone had run into this before. And then if you're lucky, maybe the, you know, this one, incorrect product something, is something that happened again. Let's read that one. Oh, uh, Osmond was involved in this. Let's talk to Osmond. Do you remember what happened? Yes. And maybe you can resolve the incident much quicker. I don't know. So it, is, it can be very useful to have this kind of repository of incidents. If nothing else, they contain the name of the people. That was also a difference. Sorry, I'm, uh, when I, we st we had kind of incident management process at Sheepset before we got into IMS, but then we took great effort on not putting the names of the engineers in that because people were afraid that you would get blamed. But when you're doing the I IMS process, instead, no, put the name in because when you run into the problem again, I want to know who was there to solve this thing. Yes, it was a sort of, you know, Osman again, my, uh, or, or, or Carlos that did the thing. I want to call them and talk to them because I don't want to figure out through some weird third person thing. Put the name in. It, if you have a blame free environment, there's no problem putting the name in. And so this instant live incident template, it contains a description. It contains an instant severity. This is people not agreeing on, but for me, it's A is, yeah, if we don't fix this, the company is going bankrupt in uh, five minutes or something like that. And B is, yeah, it's not as bad as that, but we really should fix it now. And C is, it can probably wait till tomorrow. Uh, I have a, a list of all the roles, and we should always have an instant commander. Put in your name there if you're discovering it. And here, if you have an operation lead, you put in name, otherwise it's the instant commander. I have a status which contains timestamps and descriptions, which my manager can see what are you doing. Uh, and uh, trying to uh, get an understand. So it's up to me as an IC to maintain that, that it contains relevant things. As I'm a kind of a product manager as an incident commander, I need to keep a little bit eye on what people are doing because things are happening so fast, people can get distracted. So I need to follow up. Are we still working on duplicates, Osman, or have you get distracted? Um, or is it not important anymore? Uh, I have a to-do list, what people are supposed to do. And when I discover more things to do, I add it here. Uh, an area for hypothesis where we just think, put in things. I think we think these are the things that are the problem. We're not sure, but we should check it. And then I might identify a th few things that we should probably do this, but we can't do it now. But then I put it in here. I, I also like to have everything with the incident in the incident document. So I also run the review here. So I have the incident review, describing the review process, uh, suggested actions, accepted actions, and the timeline. So then everything about this incident when this finally gets closed, is in this uh, instant document. And that's essentially it. So in, the intention is not to be that big of a thing, but to give you a little bit structure. So with that said, um, I was a little bit worried about time. So I think I have some time left for questions at least. Yes, go on. Yeah. Well, uh, we don't. Mm, okay, the question was, how do you protect developers from being stalked by customers? So we don't expose this list to customers in general, right? So this is kind of for our internal team process. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, I would, we wouldn't put it on the front page. <laughs> Right. If you write a press statement, it would be something else and not listing people individually, uh, like you said. So, so that, that is, would be my answer to that. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, you there? Yeah, so the question was, uh, do, I, do I think the process is uh, suitable for all, uh, all sizes or just large ones? Actually, I think it's very flexible in the size-wise. Uh, since I personally think for a team, 
that his user is. I think for me, I would choose to go with this. Maybe it's not, it's not trivial, but it's kind of, yeah, it's a little bit more than trivial. I need to do some steps. I would like to remember these steps. Then I try to use this process, but I'm probably just one guy then. I'm just the instant commander. So I think it's done. What I also like about this process, it actually scales up um, to multiple teams. So what we noticed at Cheapstead was that we started thinking this was a good process when we had to do certain tasks that were not strictly incidents, but we need to sort of synchronize the feature out in Aftonbladet, in Pulse, and some other analytics team, and we want to synchronize all the teams. And then we found that this process was very useful for that, uh, to make sure that that happened, kind of a mini project. So I would say it works for uh, small incidents up to several teams. I don't know super big incidents, how that will work out, because I've never been involved like more than four or five teams. But it, it, I think it's quite scalable. Uh, it's another hand. The, the question was, have you ever seen a similar process in other companies before? No, actually, for some reason, I've never really seen an incident management process. I'm sure there are, but I was not exposed to it. But I have been exposed to incidents, and then I was just kind of winging it, and it never felt good. But uh, I was working at Ericsson for a while, and I'm pretty sure they had some kind of incident response. Uh, uh, process. But no, I didn't see it myself. So, looking for some more. Uh, there's another hand. Very good. Thank you. Well, so the question was if you're on call and this is. Um, uh, the, the demands to respond are so high, so you don't feel you can do documentation. Uh, would I still do this? So obviously that's a, a question that you have to um, make your own judgment. But I think it's very seldom I for real run into situations where we couldn't try to do the process. So for example, when I mentioned the incident I had when I worked with Carlos, uh, about the incident. This was extremely urgent for us, but because I was able to offload operationally to Carlos, I could still do the process here. And it was still valuable because I was capturing things that were valuable for us in the future. Now, if you're the single person on call, um, that's a judgment call, right? But if it's trivial, you probably just do it, and maybe you do the documentation afterwards. But if it's non-trivial, I, th I personally think it can be good to try to sit down and do the steps in your head through the documentation to check, am I right? Because I have one thing I really want to avoid always is go from severe to B to severe to A. And if I'm stressing things, there's a risk I do that. And, then, and I've been in that situation myself where I've been saying to myself, why didn't I just put a begin transaction, rollback transaction here to try it in the SQL server? Why did I just hack it? And now I have a huge problem on my hand. So it's a judgment call. But for me, it kind of had to be trivial and really stressful to not do it. Uh, if it's complicated, I will probably do it because I, I need to think. Otherwise, my brain doesn't work that quick. Well, thanks for question. Uh, anything else? Yeah, another same hand maybe, or no, new guy perhaps. Never mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so the question was kind of, uh, if I strive for blame for the environment, and uh, but the environment we have is kind of toxic and. Um, yeah, that is a very hard question, right? It's it obviously, uh, because how do you change a culture? That can be very difficult. Um, perhaps you can use metrics, um, I'm just guessing, to sort of say, to approach the management saying, because people are afraid and need to, feel re need to protect themselves against blame, we are not working this as effectively as we can. Uh, uh, if you create a blame-free environment, because we are not bad people here, I guess, because you, why would you hire bad people? Um, I think we should work towards changing this culture to that it's okay to make mistakes. Uh, I don't know. 
and that would give better response time for us and happier customers. Uh, but I think it's a very tough question, uh, and it's probably not easy as well because culture, changing culture, it's the you know it's the people that in the culture, it's hard. But I think it's better for everyone if you do it. But that was a good question, but I don't have a good answer. But uh, you need help. Uh, and, uh, but uh, this is another thing, uh, kind of what you're saying. In order for me to function as an instant commander, and uh, basically every role, I feel I need trust. And if I feel that people, my manager, aren't trusting me to perform my work as instant commander and try to overrule me all the time, like, no, no, you can't do that, you have to do it this way, you can't do that, that. Well, I would just say these days, well, you know, I cannot, I cannot do this role. I cannot be the instant commander with you overruling me. Obviously, you, then you are it. Because otherwise, I can't do it. Uh, because you're constantly uh, sort of double checking me. And uh, do you want to do it? And uh, maybe they say yes, and, they, uh, and that's fine. Or they say no, well, I, I can't do it with, um, without trust. But it's hard, right? But luckily in Sheepset, I felt that uh, 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 the trust between the management and the, and the developers were quite good. So there, I think it was one of the reasons it worked well. Anything else? Well, uh, it seems running out of questions. You have like uh, five more seconds. But uh, other than that, I will say um, thank you for listening and I hope it was uh, reasonably useful for you.